Okay, I am very happy to introduce Sonnet Ireland today. Sonnet is the director of the Washington Parish Library, which is a four branch public library in Louisiana. She's also worked in the St. Tammany Parish Library, the University of New Orleans, Loyola University of New Orleans, Tulane, and she is a past president of the Louisiana Library Association. She received the 2024 Louisiana Library Association Meritorious Service Award. And you also may have seen her in uh, the John Oliver's um, program that he did on libraries a few months ago. She was a librarian that was testifying before the uh, Louisiana legislature, and she was the understandably exasperated librarian who was um, testifying against a proposed bill to limit access to library services. So I'm sure that she will tell you more about that today. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over, hand it over to Sonnet. Hello, as you can see, a little technical glitch there. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today to talk to everybody. And um, let me double check that my screen is in fact sharing. It is, yay. So um, that's pretty much who I am, Sonnet Ireland, uh, easy to Google. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, also, all my slides will be available. Um, now. All of this is going to be from personal experience, and um, and some of it is from you know training through the mental health first aid. Let's let's get going. Uh, so today we're going to talk about sources of stress, uh, how to cope with stress, helping others cope, and of course burnout. And this to me is a wonderful. Uh, visual of just what stress does to the body and it pretty much affects everything um, you know and we can have some of these all of these one of these it just depends on the person uh, some people will have insomnia while others will have headaches it just depends but the goal is to try to lessen that effect on your body so I am not a therapist I am not a mental health professional. Um, I do have, again, the mental health first aid training, which I highly recommend. And if you can afford a therapist and you can find one, I highly recommend that as well. Um, I will caution you that if, if you're not used to that, you may have to try different ones before you find the one that actually helps you. A lot of times people will go to one and they're terrible or they don't gel with them and then they never go back again. But, you know, sometimes you have to find the right one. But again, mental health first aid training, I think is wonderful training for anyone in libraries. So to me, and I think most of us can agree, the number one stressor to me is people, whether it's external people like local politicians and some of their rhetoric, or vendors not doing what they're supposed to, or having glitches, or often the largest source of stress in libraries, patrons. Even patrons who are nice can be stressful. And it's not easy to help someone with something personal that might be upsetting or sad. There have been a number of days when I would just have a good day until I had to help someone who was in a really bad situation. And I think we forget how much emotional labor goes into our work. So that's very important to remember. And of course, internal people, and this can come from the top, your boss, director, board, or from the bottom up, uh, people that you supervise, your coworkers or your peers. And again, even lovely people can cause stress whether they want to or not, whether they're aware of it or not. So dealing with external people, uh, and again, this is people like patrons, um, you know, maybe leaders of the community. Uh, where I am, there's a lot of book banning activity in St. Tammany Parish and across the state. 
So um, this is something that we deal with on a regular basis. I recommend slowing down. I feel that um, we kind of react the way we would have if we were still, you know, hunting woolly mammoths. Uh, when you're faced with stress, your body doesn't necessarily know that the threat isn't physical. All it knows is that you are in danger or you you perceive that you're in danger. And so it reacts to help you survive. And unfortunately, outrunning the woman who needs help with the copier is not an option. You can't climb a tree or play dead when you're at work, or at least I imagine it would be frowned upon for most of you. So you have to find ways to counteract that. And slowing down, just stopping and recognizing that, you know, you're having this reaction, focusing on breathing because we start to make our breath shallow without even realizing it um, and taking the time that you need to stay calm because if you're flustered, it's only going to make things worse. So do your best to stay calm and find ways to calm yourself down. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. Actively listen to the person. And I know, um, you know, we all listen, but sometimes we're listening for the chance to respond or we're listening um, in a way that is kind of hurry up, get to the point. So when you're listening to someone who has a complaint, acknowledge how they feel. Uh, repeat back to them in your own words, your understanding of the issue. Um, ultimately, if there is an error on the part of the library, apologize, or you can even apologize um, for how they feel or for the situation that they're in. Um, and of course, the paraphrasing allows them to correct you if you have misunderstood anything. And it might even help them gain a new perspective. There have been a number of times where I have been having a discussion with an upset patron, and it turns out that they have a misunderstanding of a policy or a procedure, and they're using a word in a different way than we use it. For instance, graphic novels. I really do believe that um, some of the problems in our libraries down here is just the fact that people think graphic as in graphic movies, um, adult books, adult content, adult movies, and they're not understanding that, no, it's an adult book because a child can't read Pride and Pre Prejudice when they're five years old. Uh, it's a book that adults read. Um, so it's, I think there's some miscommunication there. But um, if you're not a manager, don't be afraid of sending the situation up to the next level. Uh, don't be afraid to get your manager involved because that is what managers are there for. And if you are a manager, don't be afraid to say you need to look into a situation and get back to the person and follow up just letting them know that you care about the situation, you understand what the issue is, and that you're going to move it to somebody who can help them, or you're going to look into it further, a lot of times that can calm the person down. Now, I will be honest, I have been this person, but luckily not to anyone's knowledge except my husband's. Um, one of the things I like to remember is you don't know the kind of day someone has had. And it's not fair, but there are times when you have a really bad day and you take it out on someone. And there have been a number of times when being nice to someone actually made them stop, realize how mean they were being, and actually apologize and explain that, you know, their child was in the hospital or whatever is going on, you know, their house burned down, whatever the issue is. For me, it was my mother passed away. And the funeral home was saying that they weren't going to be able to accept the check because they were about to, that I needed to give them in person because they were about to leave on a call. And so 
I got in the car, I managed to keep them on the phone, and my poor husband is driving. And of course, it's at UNO, University of New Orleans, on their campus. And my reaction was run over the kids, run them over. They shouldn't be, you know, crossing the street without looking. Do I mean that? No, absolutely not. But I was in a very bad place emotionally, and I was dealing with somebody who wasn't wasn't willing to make accommodations, wasn't understanding that I was literally five minutes away from their location and that I was bringing the check to them when they were telling me they were about to close. And luckily the the manager, when I got him on the phone, he was like, of course we can wait 10 minutes, no big deal. Um, but remembering that situation helps me remember that sometimes you just get somebody on a bad day. And it's very helpful to know that no matter how nice you are, think of the nicest person you have ever met. Somebody thinks that person is a jerk. Somebody caught them on a bad day. So that helps. The big thing I do want to point out is take a break after something like this happens. Even if it's five, 10 minutes, take a moment to reset because your body is having this reaction and sometimes we just go right into the next thing without giving our body time to come down. And that can sometimes make other interactions go poorly that normally wouldn't go poorly. So my staff is used to my weird rules. Uh, if you watch NCIS, Gibbs has his rules. Well, I have my rules, but they're all pop culture. So Roadhouse rules. I don't know how many of you have seen the original Roadhouse from the 80s with Patrick Swayze as Dalton. That is the only one I have seen. I will eventually see the new one. But to me, Patrick Swayze is Dalton. And I am not ready to accept Jake Gyllenhaal as a replacement, though he's perfectly nice, I'm sure. There is a scene in Roadhouse where Patrick Swayze is, or Dalton, is coming to this a bar as a cooler. He's he's coming to straighten up this bar. It was the original bar rescue, if you will. And in the scene, he explains the rules. And it's, you know, it, don't don't underestimate your opponent, blah, blah, blah. The third rule is the most important one. The other two rules I do listen to, but for my staff, the third rule is the the big one. Be nice. And I cannot show the clip and I cannot quote it because, of course, there is uh, adult language. But something he says is, be nice. It's nothing personal. It's just a job. Um, and that's the key. It's nothing personal. You, you feel it's personal because that's human. But you aren't really what the person trying to fight you is angry about. So... In the words of Dalton, be nice until it's time to be not nice or to not or to stop being nice. And honestly, that's your manager's job or your director's job. And it's up to them to figure out how to handle it. I have a better understanding of what's at play when certain situations arise. I know where I can be not nice and how to be not nice in a way that you know, doesn't involve us making the newspaper or, um, you know, hopefully doesn't in ignite the uh, or fan the flames of book banners in the region. I know how to very succinctly but politely say, you are not allowed to speak to my staff that way. Um, and also, it kind of let, let me, excuse my language, but let me be the bitch. Like, you're that nice, poor person that you were nice to that person the whole time. You're the the staffer who, you know, put up with so much. And I'm the director that comes down on the person who is mistreating my staff. So be nice until it's time to not be nice. Um, when they yell, keep your tone soft, bring your voice down, set the tone and make it clear to anyone who watches the interaction that you are not in the wrong because you have the high ground. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And you don't want to give that up. You want it to be clear to anyone witnessing this, what is happening, that you are 
handling this in a professional manner, in a kind way as much as possible. Um, so don't, you know, you've got to set the tone. And of course, um, for fans of Archer, have some phrasing saved and practiced. Um, it's fine to read these, but if you like phrasing, if you actually um, find it useful, write it down or save it to a file and practice it theoretically or periodically and think about um, when you might use it or actually work on making some of your own. Um, we all have patrons that we can anticipate exactly what they might say when we have a new policy or a new procedure and having a script, you don't have to adhere to it perfectly, but having a script gives you a sense of power that allows you to stay calm, or at least it does me. And I'm terrible at following scripts. Like I was a drama minor until it got to having to perform in something. And then I just dropped it and went with the world religions minor because I was not good at acting, but I can ad lib. So if I have the gist of something in my head, that's why I practice it. I can do it and I can save myself some anxiety. So, you know, phrases that you can practice. Now, how do you help a coworker? Know when to interrupt. Um, this can be, if you know the person very well, it gets easier. There have been times where people have tried to help interrupt my husband from talking to me when they didn't know who he was. Um, and it wasn't that he was being inappropriate or anything like that, but I guess they thought, oh, there's this guy and he's, he's looking at her a little too friendly. Um, and he keeps talking to her and she probably wants to escape. But most of the time, you know, those patrons. And if you don't, if you're not sure, have a key phrase or a signal. We used to have a, a signal at the reference desk when I worked in St. Tammany a million years ago, um, where I think it had to do with a certain part of my head. If I scratched a, per a certain part of my forehead, it was a signal to the, um, the circ desk or the um, computer lab desk that, hey, uh, I'm stuck. There's a patron who won't release me. Uh, please say that I'm needed um, and interfere nicely, you know, redirect the person who's causing stress. If somebody is, um, you know, complaining about your book display, I did have someone complain about a book display when I was a branch manager. It had, um, in their mind, it had too many anti-Trump books, but it was the new book display. And so, I kind of redirected the person by saying, oh, yeah, you know, that's interesting now that you mentioned that these are new books. And while there are some that are, you know, by Trump and by people in his administration, there's an awful lot that are, are by people who aren't. That's interesting. I didn't notice that. Thank you for pointing that out. And it kind of startles them. Um, and give your coworker an out the number of times I've had to interrupt interactions and say, hey, uh, our boss, Sue, wants to talk to you in the back. I'll finish this up here while you go see, you know, get started because she kind of gave me a rundown of what's going on. Um, but it's important you have that understanding with your coworkers so they don't come right back out and say, Sue didn't want to see me. What are you talking about? Um, but having that kind of relationship and looking out for each other, which is also a roadhouse rule, um, can really make a difference. And the right to be or right to be.org, it used to be Hollaback, right to be.org has wonderful training on this. Um, I highly recommend it. And it's for all kinds of harassment. It doesn't have to be harassment. You can use it for just, you know, things that don't quite meet harassment, but are still maybe uncomfortable. But they actually have training for harassment at the polls, on the street, online, and even at work. And it's ways that you can interfere safely. Um, and if you don't feel safe about interrupt interrupting, then get your supervisor or manager. And if they don't feel safe, well, 
at that point, they probably need to notify their administration and likely call local authorities. A big thing you can do um, is get additional help with that too. So even if you feel safe, but you're not sure how to do it easily, or you just feel you need help, tagging in another person can be great. You know, I've I've come up to people that are, you know, giving one staff person a hard time and said, hey, you know, um, isn't it time for your break? Uh, you know, instead, John here is going to help you. He's great with computers. You'll you'll love him. And then, you know, kind of switch it out when people are being a little too aggressive or a little too rude with staff. Um, another option is to, you know, have somebody else come and get you when you interrupt, you know, say, hey, give me a few minutes and then say I'm needed in the back. Um, but having these plans helps a lot. Uh, the big thing is also check in with your staff afterwards. And if it's a particularly bad interaction, use that get additional help to see how they're doing. You know, hey, John, I'm going to go interrupt the person who's talking to Sally. Will you make sure Sally's okay while I try to diffuse the situation? Stuff like that. You're a team. But yes, highly recommend righttobe.org. Now, internal people, um, I'm sure everyone here is lovely, but the loveliest people can cause stress even when they try not to. Um, and some ways to avoid creating that stress or to diffuse it to yourself uh, are on this screen. So communication is the big one. I feel like communication would solve so many problems. Um, it's just amazing to me how terrible we can all be at communication or how great we think we are when we're really not. Um, but I have found that working on your communication really helps in these situations. People are so much more receptive to policies and procedures that they may not agree with if they understand why. And sometimes you can't explain the why because of privacy issues or legal issues or politics behind the scenes. The number of times there's something going on at the parish government level that I can't divulge or maybe I don't even completely understand. Explaining that I can't explain it and, and why I can't often helps, even if it's just, I'm sorry, I promise there's a very good reason that we're changing this procedure, but I cannot share it with you because of confidentiality or because of, you know, things going on in parish government. Um, the biggest step that I think you can make is also not assuming malice. Remember the other person is human and might very well not mean to upset you. Um, even if it seems like everything they do upsets you, which at that point you probably wanna, you know, take a little break as much as you can. Um, but if you remember that they're human and sometimes I just picture them as kids, if I can picture you, what you looked like when you were a baby, I can't get mad at you if I'm thinking of you as a baby. Like you were once someone's baby. You were in cute little sailor outfits, maybe, or whatever they did to us when we were children, you know, dress us up as pumpkins. Um, it's easy to kind of think about that and remember, hey, okay, you know, this is a, another person who has their own hopes and dreams and exists outside of the library. Um, maybe they're annoying, but, you know, I can, I can live with that. Um, one of the big things I like to encourage people to do is avoid saying things like, you make me feel, or when you do this, I feel, because a lot of people take that the wrong way. Now, what I do use, and I don't even remember where I found this, I think I found it in a magazine and I told my husband, hey, I saw this, so I'm going to start doing this. And I just want you to know, if you hear me say the story I'm telling myself, I haven't lost my mind. I haven't had a stroke. Um, I'm just trying a new thing. And at first he was like, okay, that seems kind of weird, but whatever. And then literally maybe a month later, he comes to me because he was taking some kind of management course through work. And he said, guess what I learned today? And I said, what? The story I'm telling myself. 
they actually brought this up in his management program. So I, you know, it's a little awkward, I admit, and you might have to explain it to staff so they don't go, what in the world is she talking about? Um, but saying that actually really helps. And it, it has helped me in personal relationships. Um, not to get too personal, I'm just chucking my husband under the bus here. But my husband is a very quiet person. And I grew up in a household where the silent treatment was very real. And so I can sense when somebody is upset, as I'm sure most of us can, especially somebody you know. And I would sense that something was wrong. And he would do the whole, nothing's wrong. I'm not mad. I'm not upset. And finally, I told him, the story I'm telling myself when you tell me that is that you're mad at me and you're not willing to communicate with me about it because I can feel that you're upset and I know you're not telling me the truth. And, you know, we had a conversation and basically we got to a place where the answer was, you know, he doesn't want to tell me because he doesn't want to talk about it. Well, okay. If you tell me it's not about me, it's about work, I had a bad day, whatever, I will accept that. I will not question it. And in return, I will say, you don't have to talk about it. If you want to talk about it, I'm here. But if you don't want to talk about it, I'm going to leave you alone. And that works wonders because, you know, he doesn't have to feel like, oh, if I tell her I'm upset, we're going to have a whole talk. She's going to want me to tell her. And actually, he tells me more stuff now that I don't pressure him. But um, I think that actually helps a lot because you're basically saying, look, I'm not saying it's what you're doing. I'm not saying it's necessarily what I'm doing. This is just my interpretation. And I think that helps um, take people off the defensive a little bit. Um, I also have staff who are wonderful, um, but terrible at reading tone. And so the never assume malice, the don't escalate and always do your own research are inspired by this. I will be in a room with one of my staff members and we will witness the same exact conversation and she will have an interpretation that is completely different than mine when it comes to tone. And so one of the things that I think is very important is when somebody tells you, oh, so-and-so is upset about this, sometimes they're not. They just talk loud or fast or excitable and it's not that they're mad, it's that they just talk that way or something that is meant to come across as enthusiastic or jokingly comes across as um, agitation. And you just don't know what people are interpreting. And people mean well, I like to think most people mean well, but always go to the source, always talk to that person. It's not fun, um, but it's important to keep it from snowballing into, you know, a rumor mill and the drama and, uh, and whatnot. I do use the think uh, formula, but I changed insightful or inspiring, depend on what you've seen, to important because I'm sorry, but I can't always be inspiring. I can't always be insightful when I have to talk to someone, but I can make sure it's important. And so... Um, taking the time to make sure that what I need to say meets this criteria. Is it true? Is it helpful? Et cetera. That really actually helps a lot because there are times when somebody does something and I don't like it, but technically there's nothing wrong with what they did. It just annoyed me. It's just not how I would do it. But is it okay? Did I get the results I wanted? Yeah. Okay. Is it the wrong way? Is it really the wrong way? No, that's not true. Um, is there an easier way to do it? Is my way easier? Maybe. Maybe. And that might be helpful. Um, and then trying to do it as kindly as possible. You're not always going to be able to be kind in everyone's mind, but you can try to do it as kindly as, as possible. Um, and come from a place of understanding. Finally, my staff loves this rule. 
Um, if I get something that upsets me, a voicemail, a text message, or an email, how many of you start dashing off a response? It can't just be me. Uh, you start typing. I mean, my staff can hear how loud and hard I am typing, and they know. And sometimes they can even guess where the email came from because I'm just going a mile a minute ready to point out how this person is wrong and they don't understand libraries and da-da-da-da-da. So if a message irritates me, I close it out and I don't respond for at least an hour if it just irritates me. But in today's climate, uh, sometimes you have to take a little more time. And so what I usually give is three days. I, I call it my Jesus rule. Uh, my staff absolutely loves this because I have all sorts of weird rules, but it's, you know, if three days worked for Jesus, I guess it can work for me. Um, and so if it needs immediate acknowledgement, I'll say, hey, I received your message. I don't have time to fully respond, but I'll get back to you by the end of the week or I'll get back to you early next week and then give it three days. Um, because usually by the third day, you're, you know, okay, I can read it now. You didn't say I can't. You said it would be difficult to do this. Okay, let me read it. Let me understand what I'm reading. And let me respond like a rational human being and not like a crazed animal, which was my first instinct. Um, sometimes it's a week. I'll be honest. There have been a handful of emails that had to wait an entire week. That's how upsetting they were. Anyway, now that y'all think I'm insane, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about managers. Do what you can with what you have where you are. I think too many times we hold ourselves up to an ideal that no one can possibly reach. No one can reach it, but we're more understanding of others not reaching it than we are of ourselves. Um, we all have things we can do. We all have things that, you know, make other, what other people think we should do difficult. Um, this is where you just kind of take a real hard look at yourself at what you're doing and try to treat yourself with empathy, which can be very difficult. But all you can do is what you can with what you have, where you are at this moment in time. And I know that's frustrating, but keep that in mind. And with that in mind, here are some things managers can consider. Again, communication. Communication is the key. Uh, you know, location, location, location for realtors, communication, communication, communication for management. Uh, because you will be repeating yourself over and over and over again, and that is just the way it is. And when you do, you want to do it in different formats, if possible, in email, over the phone, in meetings. Um, just be prepared to repeat information a lot. Um, I will say I have found AI to be incredibly helpful with this. I, I'm not a big user of AI, to be honest, um, but I realize that I have a certain way of talking and a certain way of writing um, that I guess would be a cross between Jane Austen and um, a 1990s kid in New Orleans, because I grew up in New Orleans in the 90s, so it is what it is. Um, but as a result, I use words that other people maybe don't use as often. I blame the SATs, ACTs. Uh, I took those words to heart and I use them. You know, all these long words, they're complicated because I have to define precisely how I feel. Um, but anyway, uh, one day I was typing an email that explained a procedure. And I didn't think it was too confusing, but I was worried that it might actually be. Like, I know what I'm talking about. I understand what I'm trying to say. And maybe I'm not the best judge of whether or not this is confusing. Um, and I remembered reading a, not that long ago, because we're trying to uh, do some literacy, adult literacy at my library, that um, 
many people in my state, Louisiana, cannot read above a fifth grade level. And so I took a moment and I thought about that and probably some of my staff fit that description. Um, but even if they don't, we all can understand if they if they're at a higher level, well, then we can understand a fifth grade level. And so I actually popped it into chat GPT and I asked it to reword it for someone who could only read at a fourth grade level. Um, and I'm not saying it works all the time, but words that are natural to me might be confusing to others. And what it did was it condensed it and made it a lot more um, reader friendly. I mean, I included an example in there too. And so that's where I was really worried about the confusion. And it even rewrote the example and simplified the sentences and shortened them. Like you don't need all this extra work. You don't need the extra words in there. Um, I will say I listened to an HR podcast recently that talked about using AI and apparently you're supposed to greet it like a person um, to help it help you. It's very interesting because I have found it's a lot more helpful when I go, hi, how are you? And, you know, oh, I hope you're having a good day. And then I put in the stuff, just a weird tip that makes me feel a little strange, but uh, now everyone knows. So anyway, when working with people, it's easy to get annoyed. Um, and when they're making a mistake, you need to address it. But you can give them some grace, give them some leeway. So one of the things I like to talk about, we're going to get into the saving useful phrases for the future and the ABCs, but ask instead of accuse. Um, come from a place of curiosity. You may find out that the person's mother, you know, the person who's late all the time, um, or the person who's never been late and suddenly has been late for every shift two weeks in a row, you find out that that person's mother just had a stroke and your staff person is running herself ragged, trying to visit in the morning and after work. And this is literally personal experience of mine from my 20s. Um, so when you ask her, hey, what's going on? I notice you've been late every day. What's going on? It gives her a chance to explain what's happening. Um, and that gives you a chance to help her help her come up with a solution. And maybe that's something as simple as, would it help if we scheduled you 15 minutes later in the morning and just shifted your schedule just that much? Um, and it doesn't have to be something life altering. It could just be no matter how hard I try, no matter how early I get there, the, kid dro the kids drop off lane at school is a nightmare and I'm always 10 minutes late, just no matter how hard I try. Okay, well then let's, Let's just shift your schedule. Like, do you want to shift it half an hour? How do we want to shift this? What can we do? And that also gives you an opportunity to say, do you, do you see any other reason why this would be a problem? If we do this, do you see any reason you would be late? You know, going forward, you would regularly be late. And it gives them a chance to really own the decision and really own the change in their behavior. Um, it also helps, um, you know, it, this highlights the importance of checking in with your staff, seeing how they're doing, learning about them, uh, and praising them even in little silly ways, because you're human and your staff is human. And it's nice for them to know that from time to time, to a certain extent, um, but even if it's something silly like, oh, I always love your bow ties or, you know, you have the best skirts or, um, you know, that that program you did was amazing. Um, look at how creative you are. You're designing this. You're doing that. Um, but mean what you say. It has to be authentic. It can't just be, well, you tie your shoes very well. Like you have to try to find something that you can praise your staff about at every staff member. And it has to be authentic. It has to be genuine. Um, and, you know, you have to know, even if it's small, it's not small if you're a manager. You notice something about them. Even if it's the silliest thing, like I love your penmanship, 
it really means something to people. I will say, I think managers also think they have to somehow be superhuman. Uh, don't be afraid to write down things that you need to reference in a meeting. I mean, I think people don't realize that for a lot of managers, maybe all of us, those meetings with staff where you have to address certain issues are very stressful on our end too, because how do I share this in a way that, you know, affects change, but doesn't demoralize the staff member, um, but also is understandable. And you have all these different factors. And sometimes having phrases written down, having uh, points written down so you remember what to cover, don't be afraid to reference, you know, something that you've written down. And remember communication, communication, communication. This is the most important thing. So always be cultivating was a joke I came up with years ago when I was applying for a job. And I, I can't remember what the context was, but it was the ABCs of librarianship, always be cultivating, because I was trying to come up with a, a cute acronym for um, professional development or developing, you know, your, your skills. Uh, and so utilize free webinars. I think we forget that, you know, managing stress is a skill. Uh, it is not not work. It counts as work. If you find webinars on managing stress, helping your staff manage stress, taking care of your mental health, all of those are valid and are useful and actually should be considered work. I actually use Eventbrite quite a bit. I think there's a place, it's somewhere up north. Uh, so shout out to, I guess, I think it's in Wisconsin. I feel like it's a W state but they have some kind of women's network online that has all these great um, webinars that are free. And it's, you know, fighting imposter syndrome, how to, um, how to make yourself heard, how to, you know, how to do a resume even, even things like that. Uh, there's also others that do mental health, um, one of the one of the event bright events I go to, they regularly have programs on uh, various mental health issues like schizophrenia, depression, hoarders, and it's just <clears throat> excuse me, it's just an opportunity to learn how to work with people with these conditions um, and to understand them better. And they're all free. There are of course some paid things on Event Bright. They're all virtual too. Um, and some things are really inexpensive. Like I've gone to things that were $25, $15, $5. And I've gone to things that are free because free tends to be my price. Um, also, uh, the Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center, I find very interesting. They have free classes you can audit about um, the science of being happy and, and trying to relieve stress and... Um, do things that make you happy. And they also have a happiness calendar, which every month I try. Like clockwork, tomorrow I will try to complete the October calendar and I will get maybe three hours into it. <laughs> and that's it. I think I made it four days one time before it all went, you know, went into chaos. And I was just doing a day here and there. But one day I will do an entire month of the activities, but probably not this month. Maybe. We'll see. Anyway, I also love podcasts and blogs and journals. I'm a little bit of a CE junkie. Um, and I think that we are lucky that in our job, almost anything can be useful. Library work is one of the few fields where I think just about anything applies to our work. Um, once upon a time, I was actually uh, working as a reference associate, um, library associate in San Antonio. And somebody came in looking for a book by this doctor who had communicated with the dead and she saw it on TV and et cetera, et cetera. And she went to everybody in the library 
And finally, one librarian, I was in library school, one librarian was talking to another and I overheard them. And I said, wait a minute, was he in a room and he tried to connect with one grandmother, but he ended up connecting with the other grandmother and it had something to do with a mirror. And the patron said, yes, that's it. And I said, oh, I okay. My co-workers were absolutely flabbergasted because that is insane. Why do you know this? Well, I watch a lot of, you know, 2020. I watch a lot of weird things and I was curious. So I watched it and it turned out it was Dr. Raymond Moody. I will never forget his name now because of that interaction. And we were able to get her books, but literally nobody was able to find anything about him with the information they had. And it was just luck that I happened to have it. So you never know when this information will be helpful. So you're kind of not just helping your staff, but you're helping future you. And as I said, as you can see, I'm a big fan of podcasts and blogs. Um, I have enjoyed many of these. Ask a Manager, I highly recommend because that can help you um, navigate certain situations. And they talk about situations like stress and how to... Um, how to take care of yourself uh, in your profession. Um, so these are all highly recommended. Now, uh, I actually use Google Keep to save phrasing because one of the most stressful things is trying to figure out how to navigate a problem and how to get the phrasing right. And so if I read a phrase that I really like, I will write it in my Google Keep. And as you can see in the left corner, the bottom left corner, you can see that it's tagged as work. And these were some lines that um, I got from a friend. We have a little group uh, of some library directors. I have my little support group and we are constantly giving each other advice. And this was some phrasing that was shared in how to address certain problems without breaking confidentiality um, so the the topic was specifically, what do you do if a staff person comes to you with concerns about another staff person and they're getting frustrated because they're not seeing anyone address these issues, which they're not supposed to, is my, my feeling. Like, I don't want you to know that I'm addressing these things with this person because that would be embarrassing to me if it were me involved, like if it was me getting coaching I don't want everybody knowing that my boss is coaching me on something. So, you know, this is some wording that um, was developed to let someone know it's being addressed. You may not see it, but we're working on it. So another source of stress, uh, situations, technical glitches are a nightmare in, in my world. I feel like computers hate me periodically. Uh, this can include emergencies or death or illness, um, political fights in the area, or just general weirdness. You know, somebody coming in and they want you to look up information about werewolves because they're descended from the original werewolf, an actual reference question I had. Um, so it wasn't necessarily stressful, but it can be exhausting, you know, <laughs> when you're having to, you know, basically have all these interactions and maintain, you know, your professionalism, I guess. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is just accept it. And I know that's terrible advice in terms of how am I supposed to accept it? But if you can get to a place where you just acknowledge that these things will happen and you have a plan and you think through what you will do, you know, take advantage. If you have anxiety take advantage of it. Anxiety, people with anxiety have scenarios going through their head of every possible thing they can think of. And some of it gets out of hand, like what if a comet hits me or a meteorite, I suppose. Um, okay, unlikely to happen and not helpful. But what happens if I get fired? Um, I am very active in the local scene uh, defending libraries. And I have had this conversation with my husband and I have had, uh, I periodically have this moment of sitting down and going, okay, if something happens in my area and I lose my job, 
what is the plan? And the plan is literally, I will go home and cry. And I have a week of just mourning before I start looking for another job. And having that knowledge that, okay, you know, if something happens and, you know, politics gets involved and book banners get their way or whatever, um, I have a plan. It's not a great plan, not a plan I particularly love, but knowing that I have a to-do list, so to speak, of, you know, do this for X amount of time and then do this really kind of helps me feel more in control. Um, take a moment to focus. You know, there will be true emergencies where you don't necessarily have the time to focus. You need to act. But when you have what feels like an emergency but isn't actually an emergency, take that moment to focus. Take advantage of that. Remember whatever plans you have prepared, and we're going to talk about plans going awry, um, and remember to lean on your coworkers and to practice self-care afterwards. And we're going to get into that shortly, I promise. Uh, when you have a plan, expect your plan to fail. In the words of Leonard Snart, uh, Captain Cold from Flash, there are only four rules you need to remember. Make the plan, execute the plan, expect the plan to go off the rails, throw away the plan. Um, so having that you know, of course, something's going to happen idea in the back of your head as part of the plan. I don't know. To me, it gives me a sense of control. So these are things to consider implementing. But of course, if anything does not work for you, don't use it. Like if you're allergic to a medicine, don't take it. Um, I thought I would include this because literally every time I read this, I realize that my jaw is clenched and my shoulders are you know, creeping up on my ears. And literally just now, I just released my shoulders. So I thought everyone probably needed a moment. Release your shoulders and let go of any tension that you're holding on to. Because even when you're not stressed, I'm holding on to tension like 24 seven. I'm just a tense little person. Okay, getting into actually doing things to relieve stress. Check in with your body. This meme has actually been very helpful um, because there have been times where I've been really upset. And when I stopped and thought about it and took a deep breath, I was able to identify what my feeling was. Is it that everybody hates me and I'm a terrible person and everybody must absolutely hate me? Okay, sleep. And you know what? It's worked. All of these have worked. When I don't like people, probably need to eat. I'm terrible about remembering to eat. Um, and it's not, it, it's one of those things that is so frustrating. Uh, but I can tell when I start getting a little irritated, it's time to eat. And then when you feel like you hate yourself, shower. And I, I cannot, I cannot count the number of times that that has been the case where I'm like, oh, I feel gross. I feel terrible. And I'm not even dirty. I'm not gross, but it's just a feeling you have. But a shower actually does help reset it. Um, but checking in with your body, like, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? When's the last time you ate? When's the last time you had something to drink? Um, checking to see what muscles are tense. And for me, releasing emotions. I actually do. I, it's kind of weird, but I'm going to be honest. Crying baths is what I call it. Um, so I have a tendency to hold on to my emotions. I feel like we're told to be professional. We're told to, uh, keep things in, you know, so that we can be taken seriously. And I think especially women have this issue where God forbid you show emotion and it can be judged harshly by others, not all the time and not everywhere, but, you know, society as a whole, I, I'm a clencher. I am a, this is my emotion. It belongs to me. How dare you try to pry it away from me? And so there will come times where I will actually feel a clench in my chest, like not my heart, but it's like my soul is clenching. Um, I don't know how else to describe it. And um, the only thing that has helped me is forcing myself to release that. And that usually means crying. Um, and I literally have songs and YouTube clips that I have saved 
for when I need to cry. Because if I watch them or I listen to them, they will trigger the start of crying. And then instead of me shoving it down, I let it out. And I think about all the things I want to cry about in that moment and just let it all out. For me, it's in the tub, you know, because then you have a nice shower afterwards, after your nice bath. Um, but leaning into it and letting it all out, which I'm sure is not what Sheryl Sandberg meant. Um, but I think we do have things that hurt us and they're small things and we let them pile up until they're not small anymore. And so afterwards, it does feel like I've emptied a pitcher of water. So things that I think um, have helped me. And then, you know, following it up with music, a comfort show. I'm a big Parks and Rec person, the A-team, uh, um, going outside, whatever makes you feel good, even if it's just watching short videos online. These are things that make me feel good, and I know they're strange. Um Pokemon Go, I like to play Pokemon Go. I like to play Zelda, the different Zelda games. I like Sudoku, New York Times, um, puzzles like uh, the crossword puzzle, the spelling bee, all that stuff. I like to watch videos of the AITA variety, uh, particularly with Dustin Pointer and his, um, he's the red flag guy and he'll read the stories um, that are basically asking if that person is the jerk. Um, and for some reason that, that is something that makes me happy. And then of course I include Houdini because on occasion I like to try to rap. I know that sounds hilarious. Uh, and it is because I'm not necessarily good, but right now I'm working on Houdini because most of my stuff, most of my catalog is, uh, old school, like Queen Latifah, salt and pepper, you know, Snoop, like old, old stuff. Um, and uh, I think I got some Nicki Minaj, but not much. I'm I'm trying to work on it. Um, but yeah, Houdini is my current attempt. So burning out. Um, this is something I think we are all working on. And I think, or, or dealing with or working through you have to prior prioritize taking care of yourself. And I know that's easy to say, and it's annoying and there, you don't have time. I complete, I understand. It might just be a few minutes. It might just be, Hey, I do a breathing exercise for three minutes in the morning or setting alarms to remind you to eat. Uh, like I said, ever since I was a, a baby, I don't get hungry except for a very small window it's, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Ooh, I might be hungry. Oh my God, I'm starving. Oh my God, now I'm nauseous. It was fun for my parents, I can tell you that. And I am still like that. And so a lot of the time I'll start to feel bad. I'll somehow have missed the, ooh, I think I might be hungry feeling. I wasn't paying attention when it hit. And um, I'll look at the time and say, oh, you need to eat. That's why you're nauseous. Grapes is something that's uh, usually used for depression, but I have that coming up. I'll show you. Hydrate. I think drinking is, and drinking like fluids, not alcohol, uh, is something that a lot of us really need. And back to that do what you can with what you have. You know what? I gave up on water. I'm never going to like just water. I drink watered down crystal light. I drink, if I'm sweating, I drink watered down Gatorade um, to replace some electrolytes. I'm not saying that's the best option, but I have made myself miserable trying to force myself to drink plain water. And I just realized, you know what? Don't let the good be the enemy of the perfect. At least I'm getting hydration and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, taking care of myself a little bit. Add breaks to your task list. I mean, seriously, put them in your calendar if you have to and force yourself to, to take them. Uh, a support system, whether it's friends, whether it's colleagues, whether it's just strangers online, that is absolutely fine. And then find something you love. There's a very interesting um, entry, I guess. It, it's the Ask a Manager 
blog, but it's more like a website. Anyway, they recently, she recently um, did a, a thing about burnout. And apparently people shared a lot of interesting advice and there is some science to indicate that taking on something actually helps. And that's not take on more work, but finding something that uses your brain in a different way like a hobby, learning a new skill, um, even if it's just an obsessive desire to learn about something, like to suddenly learn about the War of 1812, and you're just like, I just got to know this stuff. Um, doing these kinds of things actually activates a different part of your brain that helps. And I have the link to that um, to that entry uh, in my in my slides. But these are things that you can do. And how many times do we not do something we love because we don't feel like it? I mean, I know that if I go to the pool, I will feel better. I feel better physically. I feel better mentally. Just being in the water, I feel better. And I feel better afterwards, like it stays. But you know how hard it is to put that swimsuit on, get in the car, drive to the gym, get in the gym, get dressed, you know, get undressed, get in my, you know, and not, it's not actually that hard, but it feels like Sisyphus pushing that giant boulder up. And sometimes I just have to be like, look, it'll take you five minutes to like be ready to go. It'll take you 10 minutes to get to the gym. And you're going to feel so good when you get there and you're just floating in the pool. So do it, lady. Um, also, I read somewhere about making fun New Year's resolutions. And so this is my new mission in life is to make fun goals, weird bucket list items. Um, one of mine currently is to eat at every Mexican restaurant in my parish, which is what you would call a county. Um, I got this idea because somebody pointed out how many Mexican restaurants there were suddenly in the parish, which I know they meant it racist-ish, but I thought, you know, that's interesting. There are a lot of Mexican restaurants, which my thoughts are, if there are that many restaurants um, surviving, especially, you know, now with, with the way the economy is, then my assumption is there must be a demand. So I am on a mission to go to every one of these Mexican restaurants and try them. And I even, you know, mark how many stars on Google, talk about what food I liked. Uh, I will say, I will ding you internally, not on Google, if you don't have guacamole, because I need guacamole. But having those kinds of weird things, it's kind of like a, a fun goal. Um, you know, instead of a quota for work, it's, you know, how many different types of bread can I try this year? You know, um, but the grapes, grapes is, you might have seen this if you um, have any issues with depression, um, which runs in my family. So of course, um, but this is good to remember. And it's actually hard for someone like me, but being gentle with yourself. Talk to yourself the way you would talk to a friend. You would not allow your friend to be talked to the way that you allow yourself to talk to yourself, um, if that makes sense. Or if you're anything like me, that's probably your experience. And having to actually stop and, you know, say, hey, no, that's ridiculous. No room for negative talk here. Um or at least no room for beating ourselves up. Uh, actually making a relaxation a task, like my job is to sit here for 20 minutes, you know, and just completely relax and veg out on terrible reality television. Making it something that, you know, you're accomplishing. And that's another one. Like I admit, I have put brush your teeth on my to-do list because that's an instant, like, I brushed my teeth, check. And it's a little thing, but it makes me feel better. And, you know, if you are someone who has problems with imposter syndrome, I actually keep a planner 
and I write what I do throughout the day. First, it's my memory is not that great. And it helps me if I need to remember when I had a meeting with someone, I can flip back and find it, um, which has helped me multiple times. But also I can look at it at the end of the day and go, you know what? I did accomplish stuff. Sure, it was mostly phone calls, but you know, I may not have a tangible product at the end of the day, but I did accomplish something. And again, do something you enjoy. Exercise is a hard one. Not everyone can exercise, but if you can stretch, even if it's just stretching, even if it's just, you know, a little movement, you know, that can help. And then being social and it doesn't have to be in person. You can talk, you can text, you can, you know, go online, social media. But what does that, what does that do for you in the moment? Well, in the moment, hopefully these other tools will help you be able to calm yourself down, give you a basis of knowing what works for you and what doesn't. Um, but for me, it's stopping and realizing that my nervous system is responding. This isn't me. This isn't, you know, me logically responding to a situation. It is my nervous system and just relaxing myself, unclenching my jaw, um, shutting down any negative talk. And sometimes it's hard to do that. Like I argue with myself in my head, which I'm sure does not worry any of you. Um, but I found that singing a song in my head can help or even singing a song out loud because it makes me breathe. I have to breathe if I'm singing. And so it helps me with um, regulating my breath. Uh, laughing also works. Um, remove yourself from the situation as much as you possibly can. And sometimes it's not possible, but if it is possible, do it. Um, running cold water and the colder, the better over the inside of your wrists can help calm you down. I will on occasion splash ice cold water on my face, which of course, if you're wearing makeup can be problematic. So, you know, even if it's cold water on the back of your neck, um, these are things that can help calm your body down that have a physical, your cause your body to have a physical response. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some breathing exercises, try those or an anxiety technique. There's one that I really like. And then once it passes, rest a little bit, allow your body to recover. I think too often we're like, okay, we're good now. No, you're not good. Take a moment to recover. So breathing exercises, um, Box breathing, where you inhale for four, you hold for four, you exhale for four, you hold for four. It doesn't have to be four, but it's the same number at each interval. Versus equal breathing, which is count on an inhale and count on an exhale, but you don't really have that pause in the middle. Uh, four, seven, eight breathing has worked for me, where it's inhale for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. And I have links to all this type of breathing because I figured it'd probably be hard to get everybody doing it with the webinar. The one I use the most that I've been using since forever because I learned it from a yoga DVD I checked out from the library as a teenager is the alternate nostril breathing. And that's where you close one nose, you put your like fingers here and you on your forehead and you close one side, inhale, pause, close the other side of your nose and exhale out of the other nostril. And that really does, you know, most of these um, I've used and I've found useful, but, you know, find what works for you. And there's tons of different ones beyond this. So that's why they're all the links. Just finding what works for you is the key. Doesn't have to work for your brother. Doesn't have to work for your friend. It just has to work for you. Meditation, I know this can be controversial. Um, very rarely can someone not actually meditate because there is no one way to meditate. I know people are like, oh, I can't sit still. There's moving meditation. You can meditate while you're walking. I have meditated uh, by focusing on the books I was shelving in college. So it's just a matter of finding what works for you. And if it doesn't work for you, don't do it. That's absolutely fine too. What I love is, um, and I put it under focus meditation, it's an anxiety technique, the five, four, three, two, one exercise. 
if you are maybe having a panic attack, but even if you're just feeling panicky, um, focusing on this has helped me immensely. And it's uh, name five things that you see right now. So it would be a stapler, a computer, uh, my phone, uh, my cup, my keyboard, focus on four things that you can feel. Uh, I can feel um, my chair against my body. I can feel the coolness of the air. I can feel um, the, the wood under my hands, the wood of my desk. I can feel my earphones. Um, three things that you can hear, uh, myself, the air conditioning kicking on, uh, my staff laughing in the next room. I really am wondering what's going on. And then two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. And by the time you're done with this, and I mean, you're breathing while you do it and you're, you know, focusing on that, it really does, or it calms me down at least. So I highly recommend that. There are tons of apps out there. Um, I put dollar signs next to the ones that have either paid content like paid levels or in-app pur purchases, but all of them have um, free levels. UCLA Mindful is completely free. And I, I've enjoyed using that one on occasion. I am currently using Water Llama to track my water intake. And um, I just started Mind Llama. So I don't really know if I like them a lot yet, but I do find them cute. I have used Rise, which is for sleep. And I determined, or Rise determined, that I should be sleeping almost nine hours a night, which no wonder I am exhausted all the time. I get nowhere near that. Um, I did the free trial and I was given the option to get a 30 day trial for 99 cents. They give you a seven day trial, but you can upgrade it to a 99 cent uh, 30 day trial. And I did that just to see. And it gave me a better understanding of my sleep patterns. And so now I've canceled it and I'm trying to see if I can use what I've learned without paying, I think it's like $60 a year for the subscription. So if you do that and you do the 99 cent 30 day, just don't forget to cancel. Uh, and of course, calm and soundly. But there are other resources, again, podcasts, YouTube, though there will be commercials, uh, Eventbrite, and of course that happiness um, calendar. But you would be surprised at the number of meditations on Eventbrite that you can um, sign up for, for free or for, you know, very low cost. These are some of the apps um, or some of the podcasts rather. Uh, I actually have utilized some of the sleepy ones, you know, nothing much happens. So it's a story, but it, nothing happens. So you're not trying to stay awake to hear the story. Um, and the mindfulness podcast from UCLA, um, I will admit, I did not put it in here, but I also use Dateline because I find especially Keith Morrison's voice very soothing. So I will go to sleep with Dateline playing. And my husband is deaf. He has cochlear implants. So I just play it. I don't have to have earbuds or anything. Um, he would be disturbed, I think, if he if he had his ears in when we go to sleep. But once you've put on your own mask, um, you know, here's some things you can try. We did a mental will wellness bingo with rewards for completion. Uh, we did little keychains that, you know, say your work is very important, but it says it very nicely in a beautiful poetic way. Uh, but I can't recall the exact phrasing right now. But I think we got them from Timu. But Timu and Oriental Trading are your friend for finding little tchotchkes for, for people. But the big thing is you have to participate too. You have to set the example. Celebrate weird little holidays. For me, it's hot chocolate day and pie day. You'd think it would be St. Patrick's Day, but it's just too close to pie day. And I really like pie. Um, and I got this idea from a friend who does grilled cheese sandwich day at her libraries, where she brings all sorts of cheeses and types of bread and, you know, meats and fruit 
and jam and whatever you want to do, mix it, go nuts. And she makes grilled cheese sandwiches for her staff. I did hot chocolate day because um, it was easier than trying to orchestrate making grilled cheese for everybody <laughs> in my system at all four branches. Uh, I use brownie locks to find weird little holidays like international talk, like a pirate day and, you know, use it to try to improve staff morale with a fun email or something. Stress toys are very popular. Um, I've given them as gifts to the staff, especially when COVID started. Um, I even have some at my current library for communal use. I actually have a basket of them in my office that uh, my staff use when they're talking to me. Now, sometimes they'll come in and borrow it for the day, borrow a toy. That's fine. I have candy in here too to lure them in, give them excuses to talk to me if they you know, don't know how to bring up something. Um, but it's been very helpful for staff trying to talk about something that's difficult. Um, staff prizes, you know, giving people tickets for drawings or whatever, if they, you know, attend a mental health webinar or if they take their break or lunch because people get in bad habits. Um, library sleepover was something my staff actually begged me for. And it was just, we want to we we'll want to come to the library one evening in our pajamas and watch a movie and have snacks and do a little bonding as a staff. And I was like, okay, whatever makes y'all happy, as long as it's not illegal and doesn't burn my library down. But try to make things fun. Find ways to be playful. Um, we do games at staff day, and I bought some $5 stuffed animals at the local Dollar Tree as prizes. And I was like, oh, this is stupid. No one's going to want to do this. They went nuts. I mean, they they were fighting to complete the tasks or whatever the game was um, and win so that they could get a little stuffed animal. So you never know. But getting to know your staff, I think, is also really important. Listening to what they think, having discussions with them, learning how they think and how they operate. And the most important thing out of all of this is leading by example, because um, if you don't take breaks, your body will take a break for you. And I learned that in April when I had a pulmonary embolism and it was just sheer luck that it happened when my husband was home before I left for work on a Monday morning in April. And uh, um I had to take a break. I had to take a week off. Um, I'm fine. It's not that big of a deal uh, now. But I realized that when I tell my staff, sick leave is there for you to use. And that includes mental health. You don't have to tell me you're having a mental health day. Tell me you have a headache. Just make sure I know it's not contagious. If you tell me it's something that's not contagious, I don't need to know any more than that. Uh, but with COVID, I need to know if it's contagious now. Um, we don't work for free. Uh, and I know that's not really true when you get to like the level of a director. Um, but my staff is constantly trying to do things off the clock. And if they see me doing stuff off the clock, uh, they're going to think I'm holding them to a secret standard that they don't know about. No matter what I say, they think that in the back of my head, oh, but she called in sick. I didn't call in sick when I had the flu, which also don't do that stay home when you're sick and it's contagious. It's just nice. Um, and also remind people, you know, these are things they need to do, but then also hold yourself to that standard. These are my recommended resources um, that I reference throughout. These are books that I've found very useful. Uh, the Courage to be Disliked, especially. And that's me. Thoughts, questions, comments, nightmares, life goals, whatever. Um, I can answer them now. Um, I do not see any questions in the question and answer right now. I, there are a number of comments in the chat of things other people have done to ease their own stress. Um, well, Wendy says, thank you. I, As you were speaking, Sonnet, I was thinking about, um, I never thought of it this way, but sometimes when I am getting like need to get myself calmed down. I do math <laughs> problems in my head because then your mind has to focus on the math and the, can't oh. focus on all these things that are going through 
I may like try that. My mind, so I may try that. For me, it's um, songs that I that I you know listened to when I was younger because I know the words, and I can focus on like trying to breathe. But also, um, I think it could be you know if the Constitution is your thing or the Declaration of Independence. But math, I love that. I may yeah. try that. That may make it worse for me though. I don't know. <laughs> Well, when um, Sonnet and I met to talk about this program, we said we were going to focus on stress and we weren't going to focus on the stress that she has, that they've been going through in Louisiana. But I know since there are no questions in the Q&A, I know that there were a few people who were wondering what the uh, landscape is down there right now. Uh, if that's not oh. going to cause you too much oh. stress to discuss it for no, like five minutes. It's, <laughs> it's fine. I am lucky that my library is not dealing with this right now, but our millage is coming up. So we probably will be soon. But because I live in one parish uh, and work in another, I have a lot more freedom than a lot of my director friends have. Um, so in St. Tammany, I mean, stuff's on fire down here and it's really i have tons of presentations if y'all are interested they're all on my website but basically um what has really helped me is finding where i fit in and because i'm now a director and i have a library board and because i used to work in saint tammany so i know how things work there um and because I've been paying attention to this since 2017, when things first started in Lafayette, um, I'm able to say things and I'm able to point things out that other people might not be able to. So every time someone gets up at a St. Tammany Library board meeting and they're yelling at the board for how they handled something or why are you getting outside counsel um, to defend you? against, you know, if somebody sues you and I get up there and my answer is, well, because the DA recused himself and said that we needed, you know, the library needed outside counsel. So yeah, that's why they're spending money on that. If a lawsuit, if you get sued, you don't just, you can't just ignore it. Like if you ignore it, you lose. That's how that works. And um, so being that kind of obnoxious voice that says what the board wishes they could say um is kind of my my little role also i'm really good apparently at keeping track of people's comments and then spitting out why they're not true <laughs> and um yeah it's they boo me actually the uh the opposition boos me when my name is called now which just is spite it, i i now function out of spite so ha huh, jokes on them um Oh, well, that definitely does sound stressful. Um, but we are all, as you know, the whole li library community is um, working to support you all down there. And we're worried about it here, too, which is why I think a number of people registered for this program. Um, I have put in the chat links to um, a form if you want to get a participation certificate. There's also a link to the evaluation. I will be sending those out shortly so if you missed it you will get it in an email if um if you use your email to register for this program uh oh, thank you very much there are also a couple of the programs that we are doing coming up that are tangentially related to the same topic on october 10th at 11 a.m our our ref our rio Reference Instruction and Outreach Interest Group is doing a program on the election is coming, which we didn't address directly today, but um, how to deal with uh, those questions and the stress in your library related to the election. And then on October 17th, we're having a webinar called You Can't Teach Nice Retail, although I think you've done some things today, Sonnet, that have taught us nice. Uh, Retail Management Strategies for Enhanced Library Customer Service, and that is a webinar, and you are all welcome, and it's free, so you're all welcome to register, and if there are no, I see just a lot of thank you in the uh, in the chat, but if there are no further questions, we will thank Sonnet, and uh, just watch your email, or you can always email me at susan at cdlc.org, and I will get um, all of the resources that we went over today to you, so thank you, Sonnet.
Thank you. Thank you for having me.